You're listening to the Culinary Garden Show. I'm Sarah. And I'm Alan. And we're still deep in fool spring. I thought maybe we'd be out of it after a week, but we're here. Well, it's actually a really nice day. It rained for what seemed like the better part of a couple of weeks. Being a warm, sunny day, it feels a bit spring-like. It's true. I know. It's getting there. I just mean things move so slowly at this time of year. It feels like I watch like crocuses come out like every day for a month. And I know it hasn't been a month, but it has been a couple of weeks. So I'm not complaining. I'm excited. But But if you look really closely, you can see tulips are coming out. I noticed daylilies are starting to punch out and lots of other little green bits. Grass is starting to turn green again. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, it's been warm enough to do a couple of little tiny things outside, just sort of going and poking around and seeing what's alive and and getting excited. It's mostly been the rain that's been an issue here. It's true. Yeah. Yeah, it's saturated. The community garden, uh, we had a day scheduled for doing some dormant winter pruning, but it's actually so wet down there because it's at a fairly low spot in town that we didn't end up doing it uh, maybe next week. But it just is the ground when it becomes saturated with water like that, with puddles, you don't want to be walking around on it because it can even compress tree roots and gardens. And if you have like a garden bed that you uh, are walking on, you really want to avoid it when it's that wet. Yeah, Sackville, New Brunswick, where we're located, is at the bottom of the ocean. It is land that's been reclaimed by a a series of dike works. And so the community garden is literally at sea level. Yeah, it was a salt marsh before it was anything else. so. So it takes a while for it to drain out in the summer. Yeah. Yeah, so this weekend we, uh, did some exciting garden uh, planning, and also we'd had a seed event, which was great, uh, which was a seedy Saturday seed swap. So we had some people from the community come out and bring seeds, and we had some seeds available, and the community garden has a small seed library as well. So we put them all out on a table, and people came and just took some stuff, left some stuff. There are so many different varieties of plants, and I find it so interesting. Uh, And also, everybody has sort of their own favorites, the things that they really like to grow. uh, And I find those, the things that they grow also align with sort of what they like to get out of their garden, whether, you know, they're big flower gardeners or herb gardeners, whether they're trying to plant a lot of native plants, whether they're just growing vegetables. Uh, There's so many different kinds of things you can grow from seed, and just seeing them here. Uh, was really awesome and exciting to just have these big piles of of seeds that people had saved or bought or collected uh, in all kinds of different ways. So there's a lot left over, and it made me rethink some of my seeding plan because now we've got a bunch of other different odd ones. And we're going to have some space at the community garden this year as well that we're going to plant out uh, as sort of a communal area. It's been uh, newly tilled land, so it's not necessarily going to be super productive, but we're just going to try it as an experiment. And so definitely have some interesting, fun uh, varieties to try here. So thanks to everybody who came out. It was a really fun event, and we hope to do it again next year. Yeah, so how, like, if I have seeds that have been in my, you know, shed for, uh, ye- like, how long are seeds good for, I guess is what I'm asking. Certain seeds, they don't last very long at all. Other seeds can last, like, up to 10 years. I think, like, the carrot family plants, they generally last a really long time, but then lettuce seeds, not so much. And I find actually, like... I've been using some old bro, like Mitsuna and Tatsui Asian green seeds to grow microgreens, and I'm getting pretty bad germination out of those. So I think they only last maybe two years. My, my general rule is I've been throwing out anything that's older than 2021. 20, I'll sort of keep things for like three or four years and then toss them after that. And what, what about like... Uh... Are, can you leave seeds like outside in your shed if your shed goes below zero in the winter? Yeah, seeds can freeze. I've definitely kept seeds in freezing conditions. Uh, Even again, seeds of like plants that are like sun loving, like like peppers or something from the south. Yeah, good question. I I don't think it would kill them. I've definitely done it before and had the seeds still work. I think that. Anything that you do to mishandle your seeds, maybe they are too hot as well. That's something that can happen. You leave them in your shed in the summer and it's like 40 degrees in there. Uh, They just reduce the germination rate. So it's going to kill off some of the seeds, but not all the seeds. 
And in those cases, what I do, if I have some old seeds that I really want to germinate, then I just take the whole package and dump it into a tray and then see if any come up. Or a lot of people, what they do is use a uh, paper towel. And I, I don't know, I don't tend to do that. I find it's hard to pay attention to keeping the paper towel perfectly moist and it tends to dry out on me. And then you just have like dead sprouts. Exactly. Yeah. Which is not the point, but I don't know. I find I don't have that many seeds that are old that are that precious. Like if it's something that I want, I'll either save seeds every couple of years, like with cilantro or dill, I always save seeds from that because that's easy to do. Uh, and if it's like a special kind of zucchini that I had, you know, too many zucchini seeds in the package, cause you end up with so many, uh, I'll just rebuy it. I'll buy the same variety. Do you save seeds? I save some seeds. Yeah, definitely every year, but not like as a serious thing. I mean, to let plants go to seed takes up a fair bit of space because you have to maybe like let your lettuce bolt and then make flowers and then make seeds. And I generally want the lettuce out of there once it's bolted so I can plant more lettuce. But actually the variety that we had last year, which was a miniature green oak leaf, remember those? Those were fantastic. They were fantastic. And those were actually seeds that I had saved that I don't know where they came from originally, but I had saved them because they accidentally bolted in an area where I just let them go. Um, so I saved a whole bunch of the seed and, and that's what I've been planting. So those will run out though, unless you... Exactly. I didn't save any last year, but next year we'll put aside a couple to, to bolt. I, wor I worked on a farm once in Quebec that did a lot of seed saving and it was neat because they used like red flagging tape. So you'd be going through the field and you'd spot this like massive zucchini, but then it had flagging tape on it. And that meant that zucchini was left there for a seed. Hmm. I'd be interested. Like, how do you get this zucchini seeds out of the, like, it just seems to like turn to slop after a while. Yeah. Well, you let it get like giant. That's the thing with zucchini or squash seeds. You let them get as big as possible and get to like their full maturity. And then they kind of almost dry out. You know what I mean? When you have like one of those giant zucchinis that like the outside gets really hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's the stage you want to get it at even past that to save seed. So it might be something we could do this year, just to experiment around a little bit. To grow a big zucchini and not eat it? Yeah, exactly. I think I've done that before. Yeah, I think we've all done that before. I noticed that the the daylilies, like, they're starting to pop out. So I know where the daylilies are, like, because I can see them. Now, daylily tubers are edible, right? Yeah, like, they are. Like, you can forage those. And they're similar to, say, like a Jerusalem artichoke. Yep. So there are a few things that you could find out there in the world uh, at this early in the spring and like forage to eat. Yeah, I would say roots is a good one. A Jerusalem artichokes, definitely. That's a good point. I've, I haven't been thinking about them, but there are so many at the community garden and we could probably go and forage them now because you want to get those tubers before they start sprouting. When they sprout, they start to get you know, kind of mushy and they grow secondary roots, but now's the perfect time. And yeah, daylily tubers as well. I ate some last year and they were actually really sweet. They had sort of the same crunchiness as Jerusalem artichoke, which is kind of almost like a carrot more than a potato, but a real like sugar hit. And then there's some other uh, plants that you would forage the early shoots of that yeah. you could find, like probably maybe not today, but very shortly, like knotweed right. would be coming up. Yeah, there's a lot of beautiful early spring shoots to forage as soon as things start to green up a little bit. We're a little bit early on that, but we're getting there. And then another one is like cattails or bulrushes. Yeah. But often you have to sort of like look for these things early because the they're not as good when they get big they're like kind of like asparagus like you want to get it when it's just poking out of the ground about three to four inches for sure and then after that it's not as delectable yeah another one is hop shoots right right so yeah hop shoots are interesting because if you grow hops um which a lot of people do for brewing they will come up at this time of year and uh, hop shoots are uh, have the the record of being the most expensive vegetable 
ever. Someone, a chef in the Europe paid a thousand dollars for an earth, a pa- like, I don't know. It's just a story that I've noticed before when I was trying to figure out if you could eat them or not. And they're like asparagus. They're kind of a bit hairy. They are. So yeah. you have to like, uh, like blanch them or fast fry them to get those little hairs um, to disappear. And I believe we once did that and then wrapped them in like pancetta or bacon. Yeah, which, yeah, like, totally. Just holy, like asparagus. So good. Yeah, it was really good. But then after a while, they just become bitter and tough. Yeah. So you have to get them really early. So a lot of the ephemeral spring foraging greens would be things that you have to get at a, in a very brief period of time. Are they ideal for eating. Yeah. And that's, I think one of my favorite garden words is ephemeral. Don't mm-hmm. you think? Yeah, it's cool. It so, has a pH, not two Fs. Exactly. I went to spell it the other day and I got it wrong. Yeah. So ephemeral just refers to the fact that a lot of the things that come out in spring, that's their time. And then they go away and they disappear. Like if you think of a later garden, you don't see any of the bulbs once you know, they've flowered and then the leaves die back, they disappear and you can plant other things on top of them that take up space. So spring ephemerals are pretty special plants because they sort of fill a niche when there's not a lot going on in the garden. So they're some of my favorites. And then, uh, yeah, and they can refer even to not only flowers, but vegetables, also wild plants that are spring ephemerals. Like you know, So another one that's really popular is South like further, much further south of here is like ramps or wild garlic or yeah. those sorts of things. But they don't really grow around here. And if you do find them around here, you really shouldn't harvest them, should no, you? No, no, they don't really grow. I, I saw something about this the other day and like ramps are not native to this area, but somebody mentioned that they had find they had found patches of wild alliums that had sort of been planted and got out of control. Like I know where there's a patch of wild chives in Sackville, Hmm. which has basically just probably got dumped uh, down the back of a property out of somebody's compost heap when they were harvesting or weeding, you know, and then you end up with like a small patch of chives. And like when I found it, it was probably like five or six like square feet and there were so many bees on it. It was incredible. Oh yeah. Bees. Where are they? Bees, they're still, they're still chilling out in the ground. They're starting to come out slowly. So like bumblebees, the females uh, have been hiding uh, underneath the debris in your garden for the winter and they'll start to come out on nice days, but they're not really doing any like foraging or eating yet, but they will be soon. So we really shouldn't be raking up the leaves around the yard so much because the bees are still in there. Yeah. Yeah. We talked about this a while ago and I think we said that, 10 degree daytime temperature was sort of where they say that's going to harm the least insects. And I've read a few things since, and it sort of said really insects come out at like all temperatures and all throughout the year. So there's no magic number that you can kind of wait for, but delaying it is a good idea. And if you have like a perennial garden, like, like we do where there's a lot of like leaves and mulch around all the perennials, it's better to like gently go and just clear them away a little bit instead of taking a rake and going through the whole thing. So I got to leave my leaf blower in the shed oh my for a God, while. Leaf blowers are my least favorite. I did rake our lawn the other day because I was desperately wanting to clean something up and I felt like that was a good task. So I took some of the leaves off the lawn and raked them into the garden beds uh, where they could just continue to decompose and also you don't want you mean I don't really care about the lawn but I want it to look half decent uh, in the areas where it still exists and so taking the leaves off of the lawn is good because otherwise they tend to sort of burn holes and it won't grow there and as well I raked up a lot of maple tree seedlings which I hadn't even thought about but there were just all these like uh helicopter seeds that were just starting to germinate so uprooting all of those is good and I have to say if you do any weeding in like a woodland or perennial garden that you have pull up tree seedlings when they're tiny because they get so hard to pull up that's something you can even do this time of year as you see them germinate just go and yank them up yeah I'm I'm not a huge fan of lawns but definitely if you are going to have a lawn it should sort of work as a lawn. So leaving leaves around to like burn holes in the lawn and then having to buy a bunch of stuff to try to make it 
So it's a, you know, it's just a pain in the arse. Yeah. Yeah. We have areas of lawn and it's just like, well, I don't know. I'll turn them into something else eventually maybe, but right now. Or have now, a croquet party. Yeah, exactly. I need to save it for my croquet party. Mm-hmm. So it is still, things are really heating up in the greenhouse, no pun intended. And we have quite a few things in there. Do you want to talk about some of the things that uh, you've planted and what's coming up and what's not? For sure. Yeah. The greenhouse is really exciting right now. I feel like everything in the last two weeks has like literally doubled in size. It's amazing. And, and it really shows how temperature plays such a role in how fast plants grow because like in the back side of the greenhouse, so it's like sort of a bed on the north end, we planted a bunch of perennial herbs, uh, including like red leaf sorrel and oregano and zatar and chives and some thyme. And those plants are all also outside in the garden. So outside in the garden, they're like hardly showing any green like if you poke around at the crown you can see just a little tiny bit like that they're alive but in the greenhouse they're all up like four or five six inches like the chives are even like eight inches tall like they're totally look amazing so just that boost uh, of sunlight really like raises the temperature keeps it warm also there's not as much wind or no wind in there and so everything grows just so much faster it's really cool to see yeah, it also doesn't go through ex like we because it's under plastic. It's pretty humid in there, so it doesn't get super dry and cold, and then really hot. It 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 stays like moist. Right, and it doesn't end up with like ice and snow on top of it. Like it's sort of like as soon as yeah, as soon as the temperature warms up, it doesn't have to like spend the energy melting that that cover. So and you know we have enough space to have a greenhouse, and we just built it out of two by fours and ordered some plastic. You can buy kits that are hoops. You can even buy geodesic domes, which, which look really cool. But even just putting plants underneath like an old, uh, you know, Javex cleared bottle, Javex mm -hmm. bottle, vinegar bottle, something like that, it just makes such a huge difference that it's really just worth doing. Yeah, just that little bit of greenhouse effect really makes a difference. Mm -hmm. So the majority of the greenhouse is planted in spinach. And right now that's another thing that's growing really fast. So everything that we seeded uh, earlier in the winter in February is germinated and is growing vigorously. And then all of the spinach that we planted last fall is like ready to harvest. So we have been picking out of there for salads, which is super awesome. And then we planted some stuff in between the spinach. Yeah, so we planted some uh, radishes and some cilantro. And then also we planted some uh, head lettuces. And they're all doing awesome. They Cilantro just germinated yesterday. So it's all happening. So uh, you planted some tomatoes from seed. Uh, how is the tomatoes doing? Well, I planted a few different kinds of tomatoes. And just planted them today. So it's six weeks before our scheduled last frost date. Uh, and I think that's a good amount of time to have tomatoes inside. I don't like to get them started too early because I've made that mistake many, many, many years in a row and they just get way too big. And even though we're putting them in our greenhouse so we can sort of artificially time when we want them to go in there, uh, I want to harvest spinach for quite a good amount of time like I don't want to have to take it out early and also uh, sometimes you know you can have a cold spring and not anticipate it and and yeah it's good to have some wiggle room so I guess you know in the past we've grown many varieties of tomatoes which kinds did you settle on this year and why yeah we've grown lots of different kinds of tomatoes and I feel like I still haven't found like the tomato varieties that are like perfect. I mean, I don't know if there are any that are perfect, but I'm, I'm still searching for the ideal ones. So because to, yeah, last year was such a disappointing tomato growing season, not just for us, but for everybody, I decided this year to go with very reliable, robust tomatoes. I didn't go for the flashy, exciting, fun, colorful ones. And I had a little bit of buyer's regret today when I was realizing that. Um, so previously at something, um, seed packets often say non-GMO, uh, which you aren't likely to get GMO seeds in a seed packet 
for your garden because everything is like very highly regulated and you have to pay extra money and you don't actually buy the seed, you license the seed from the company. But there now is, is there not a tomato that is GMO that has just been introduced to the market this year? It's true. I just was learning about this. So there's an entirely purple tomato that has been genetically modified. So it has anthocyanins, which are like the purple purple plant pigment that is common in a lot of different vegetables. That's a tongue twister, purple plant. Purple plant pigment. So because we need a purple tomato. Well, it's because of health reasons. Mm. So people think sometimes genetic modification is like something that they're just like putting weird genes in things for fun. But really, it all has to do with either efficiency in growing or storage and transportation. Or in this case, it was about health. But you couldn't just have like a tomato and some beets. Like you have to have your beets and tomatoes. I agree. Where did the purple gene come from? Did you know that? Yeah, the purple gene came from a snapdragon plant. So it wasn't actually a gene that produced the purple, but it was a gene that like amplified the amount of purple that was made. So it was like a deep purple snapdragon. And snapdragons come in like all kinds of different colors. And tomatoes come in all kinds of colors. And there are already a lot of tomatoes that have that like purple color, black color, kind of like a maroon hue, but this one I saw photos of and it's like all purple all the way through, hmm. like the whole flesh of it. It's pretty, pretty cool looking, but I mean, I don't know, like I, I'm not one for really like jumping on the bandwagon of something being healthy. Like I think fresh food in whole foods are healthy and I don't need to like have the most healthy tomato ever. I'll just eat some blueberries or some beets. Yeah, it's challenging to not confuse food and medicine. Exactly. Uh, we don't eat chem- we don't eat molecules. We eat food, yeah, which contains molecules. But as a chef, it's just like you want to eat beautiful, delicious things. You don't really want to worry about the macro nutritional. Yeah, it's a whole different way to look at food, a whole different lens to see it through. So, would you know at all if these are li- have to be licensed? This tomato has to be licensed in Canada separately than the United States where the story g- generated Oh, that's from? a good question. Actually, it's from an American company uh, and it's like not a seed company, but like a plant breeding health company, but they were selling them for use by home gardeners and they've also bred them in a way that they don't, uh, they've bred them in a way that you can collect the seeds and grow them year after year. And unlike other GMOs, which are like very licensed and you're not allowed to uh, save the seed, or in a lot of cases, it's impossible to save the seeds. If you plant them again, you won't get the same plant or you won't get anything at all. Uh, In this case, they said, go for it. I think that you have to like sign an agreement saying that you won't sell them. So anyway, interesting. I think it's happening more than we realize, but this was the first example where it's something that's been taken out of the lab and going into the garden. And I don't know how, I mean, I don't feel like it's really bad. I'm not sure it's like needed, but yeah, it'll be interesting to see what other things are offered because it's definitely going to keep happening. Oh yeah, this is going to be a huge trend. Yeah, I mean, I remember my mom asking me if like mini, mini, uh, zucchini at the grocery store were genetically modified. So I think that like people don't really understand genetic modification. And yeah, I mean, maybe it'll mean that they can learn a lot more about it because it'll be more front and center and then make decisions about whether they want to use it or not. So the tomato seedlings that I planted, uh, one was called a Sylvana's gold cherry tomato. So that was like the little sun gold ones, but like an heirloom version of it. And another one was called uh, Moscovich tomato, which said that it was uh, one of the favorites from Annapolis seed where I ordered them from. And it was very reliable. Uh, it said cold hardy, drought resistant, sort of said it was everything. So oh, yeah. I don't Does know. Does it taste any good? Yeah. it's Yeah. Yeah. It said tastes good too. I, I went for like production i don't know well we grew some really spectacularly beautiful tomatoes over the last few years and they just taste like water like they don't necessarily have good flavor profiles yeah definitely and then i uh 
Yeah, I find the sun gold ones are really delicious. Oh yeah, and then the other ones that are going to definitely taste good are like the Costa Lusto Gen Genovese ones, those like Italian tomatoes that are big and wrinkly and beautiful, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I haven't grown those before, and uh, but I've seen some really spectacular ones at the farmer's market, so I know that folks around here are growing them successfully, and I just can imagine like a big wrinkly slice of tomato just with like salt on it and basil on it in the summer on a plate. Like I can't wait. Very good. Yeah. So those are the tomato varieties for this year. Oh, and I'm also growing some Scotia tomatoes. I feel like they're also one that are just like tried and true maritime heirloom variety that people Is this grow. Scotia in Scotia tomatoes refer to Nova Scotia? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, totally. They were bred in Nova Scotia probably in like the 1950s. And so they're a determinant variety, but they get a little bit taller. Um, but I'm going to grow those outside the greenhouse because they're not vining. And uh, determinant means that they are a predictable size and exactly. produce all their fruit at once. Yeah. Whereas indeterminate keeps growing and will add blossoms as it grows. Yeah. And you can also refer to them as like a determinant is a bush tomato and an indeterminate is a vining tomato. So those are sort of like the ways that they look when they grow. And I always find it fascinating that some animals are determinate and indeterminate. Apparently, really? kangaroos are indeterminate and will grow so big that they'll just fall over because they can't what? hold themselves up. Also, think of things like snakes or some fish. Right. So they can be also indeterminate. Right, like things grow as big as the, like, I mean, container that they're in, more like the environment that they're in. That's right, yeah. Huh. Wow. Yeah, it's neat. And I guess on that note, <laughs> this show is determinant. <laughs> it will continue weekly. But it's not going to grow any longer. Have a great week. Totally do.